Hey, Dean Blandino here, and I can tell you unequivocally that call was 100% wrong. This guy needs a and I'm going to find him and just give him a big <laughs> Lions fans, it's time for the podcast you've been waiting for. The show where Kool-Aid runs blue, faces turn red, and rose-colored glasses never go out of style. This is the Detroit Lions Podcast. Your Detroit Lions and Reddit connection. And now, two guys who haven't scored since 1958. Chris and Case. Hey, Heidi Ho Lions fans. Welcome to the Detroit Lions Podcast. This is episode 230. This is the official Detroit Lions Podcast for Reddit. I am your dashing host, Chris. And with me is my good friend and co-host for the day, Dean Blandino. How you doing, buddy? I am good. Episode 230. Yeah, can you believe it? That's insane. It's, it's great. Insane. And people still listen. They still listen. <laughs> well, you know, there, it's, there's a lot to talk about. Yeah, so. I, this week in particular, I think there's a, uh, a definite uh, clamor for some information, and, and you're just the guy to bring it. So it's, uh, it's a good thing to have you. Um, we're going to talk about... You know, the Lions game, there was a lot of focus on the officiating out of the game this week. Um, we got Dean on. Dean, as always, is such a great friend and great, great guy to come in and take your calls. We're going to take your calls live and let you ask him direct questions about the game, previous games, officiating in general, the NFL, everything except his home address and phone number. I think we're, <laughs> this is, is on the table. So uh, treat him like a treat him like a human being, right? He came here in goodwill. He'll he'll answer any question. You can ask him anything, but just don't be a dick. All right, we're gonna do all that. We'll probably have a lot more. We got a lot of other things lined up. Uh, you ready to go? I'm ready to go. I got my I got my signed Wayne Fonts photograph here, ready that I have that I keep with me on my desk. I'm ready to go. Even Dean has his signed Lions memorabilia. All right, really quick, we're going to do a couple announcements like we do every week. First, check us out and help us out on Patreon. Special thanks to Dylan from... Guam! That's right. Of course, our very first donor, Mathis and Brian Burkheiser from I Prevail, iprevailband.com. They are just a few of the amazing list of Patreons. We have folks who donate a small amount, a large amount, whatever you, you know, whatever you can part with every month. Go to patreon.com slash Detroit Lions podcast, patreon.com slash Detroit Lions podcast. Get access to the Patreon only Slack chat, the most intelligent Lions chat on the internet. I think Dean will agree that's a pretty low bar. <laughs> it is. It is a low bar, but clearly by far the most intelligent. You going into your, uh, your DMs on your podcast this week is this is good. Maybe we can touch on that and, and do a oh, little yeah. cross reference to that. Cause oh, that was, yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Head on over to patreon.com as little as a dollar a month in donations. Look at you access to the Slack and all the great stuff. Riz, Chris, case, all of us are there. Also give us a like on Facebook or on Instagram. Now we're trying to make the, the biggest Instagram account without a single post. That's Detroit Lions podcast. Head on over. You guys are doing a good job building that up. Of course, the Detroit Lions podcast on Facebook. And check us out on Twitter at DET Lions podcast. DET Lions podcast. The very best place to see Dean. With no pants, <laughs> just my black socks and an officiating shirt. <laughs> I'm sure there's a whistle in there somewhere. Uh, oh, subscribe <laughs> subscribe to us on YouTube, youtube.com slash Detroit Lions Podcast. Get the subscribe and hit the bell so you get notified when we go live and you can see all this great stuff. Again, youtube.com slash Detroit Lions Podcast. Also, you, we're on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, iHeart, wherever you find your stuff. Make sure you give us a re review there. And uh, I think that's all I want to talk about. Let's, uh, let's get into this. Tighten your chin straps, kids. It's time to review this week in Reddit. All right, it's time to talk about all the fun and exciting things going down this week in Reddit. And gosh, it's great to have you, Dean. Thank you for joining. And again, pretty pretty brave to come in and face you know the the belly of the beast here yeah. on a week when maybe folks aren't as happy as they could be with with what's <laughs> what's going on. Right. This was uh, I like I said I that one game maybe even that one the third quarter ruined two years of work that we've put in to try to, to try to just, you know, me reestablish me with, with the Detroit fans. I, I, I agree. That was, that was tough, but you know, this wasn't your fault. You were just there to explain it. And, and there's one that I want to explain. We'll get to that first, but um, if you want to see some of the work 
Dean did. I'm doing this YouTube thing that people do. Right there, there's going to be a link um, after this is live that you can you can click on and see uh, a great video we put together. It's pretty cool. Um, the one I want to talk about first is the Galladay catch non catch. That one was was. This is this is of course right with the Calvin Johnson rule. It was named the Calvin Johnson rule, right? Lions fans are very very familiar with trying to determine what a catch is in the NFL, and it can be frustrating and difficult. And I know, you know, we know Des didn't catch it again in that video. You you, you were very clear about that. <laughs> but um, help us understand what's a catch. Let's I guess start with the Galladay uh, catch in this last game that that was ruled not a catch. And and I have a couple things that I think about it, but I, I want to sure. start with you. Well, I think in, in the rule, the rule says control two feet or another body part other than a hand or a foot and then and then performing an act common to the game, a football move. So Galladay's going to the ground. He, he gets two feet down. He doesn't perform an act common to the game. So if he hits the ground, he has to hold on to it when he lands. And uh, and when he hit the ground, the ball did come loose. It was It was sliding down his body. He didn't have firm control of it. And that's why it was ruled – Incomplete. I thought that was the right call, unfortunately, but I thought it was the right call, and uh, and it was an incomplete pass. And, and the rule, I think people sometimes mis- misunderstand that the ground can still cause an incomplete pass, and, and this was one of those cases where that happened. And that's the, the whole surviving the ground thing was was people thought that was wiped out of the book this year with the changes, and that's that's not the case. That's not the case. No, you either you either if you're going to the ground and make a catch, you either have to perform an act common to the game, reach it out, stretch for the goal line. Or if you don't do that and you hit the ground, you have to hold on to it when you land. And I think that's where um, the pass was incomplete when he lost control, when he hit the ground. And I know, I, you know, I got a lot of questions about it. You know, was there, was there pass interference on the play? So now we're looking at the catch, you know, was there pass interference? I didn't think, and I know the league w- reviewed that because on a scoring play, they're going to look at all reviewable aspects. And that's reviewable there, then. The pass yeah, interference guess, piece is not just a coach reviewable piece. That's part of the review of, of a scoring part, play. Part of the review. So automatic review, ruling on the field, touchdown. They're going to open it up and look at every reviewable aspect. So that means the catch. That means potential pass interference. And uh, and they did look at that. I didn't think there was enough to make that pass interference. There was some contact early. Looked like the defender was trying to turn back for the ball. I didn't think that was enough, but certainly something that you now have to consider because of the rule change. Yeah. Now here's where I was at on Sunday, and and it's it's maybe doesn't doesn't line up particularly. The, the words don't line up. The math doesn't work. I guess when you, when you when you do it, where I was Sunday was I agreed with in the end it was the right call that it wasn't a catch because th- there's a period in the replay where you can see and it's a, it's one angle and I only saw it one time where he's falling. But his hands are up. The ball is between his body and his hands. It's not yeah. in possession of anything. It's not touching any yeah. part, right? At that point, he, he he doesn't have possession or control of the ball. And and the way it was moving after and before shows that he really didn't have control. So I was like, ah, that's incomplete. But what I didn't like was, and this is where the math probably isn't going to work out, but um, they called it a completion. I didn't think there was enough there to overturn the completion and the touchdown. Yeah. So I thought, okay, fine. The, the call was right, but they messed it up. So now they messed it up in our favor. Uh, we, we should live with it, but they were still able to overturn. I didn't feel like that was the case with the replay, but you did. I did. I thought, I thought it was clear. And, and sometimes that that's judgment. When you're talking about control of the football, that's different than did he get a foot down, right? Does, you know, is it moving? Is it slightly moving? Does, does it come completely away from his body? And is he not, is he not holding it with his hands? And, and that's that's subjective, and uh, you know we may look at the same play and look at it a little bit differently. But again, like at the start of the podcast, this this space is where rose-colored glasses are still okay. <laughs> you might be looking at it with those ro- rose-colored glasses. Yeah, I think you, one thing you alluded to was that football move, that reaching for the goal line. It's one thing maybe we don't want out of um, carry on for at least just a little bit till the the pain oh, subsides. Man. Let me kick out the phone number real quick. We'll take some calls as as, as people want to join, but um, we can get into the carry on play as well. Uh, give us a call two four eight seven eight two eight three eight four. You can talk to Dean. You can, we'll, we'll we'll work it out with you two four eight seven eight two eight three eight four. Or you can hit us uh, via Skype. It'll ring through as well. All one word: Detroit Lions podcast. All right. So this uh, <laughs> this carry on play. Uh, any other time, of course, so anybody else would have been down. 
Carry on Johnson, for some reason, he was on top of a pile of people. He didn't get to touch the ground. The guy who originally kind of had the ball but was on a knee and touched by a lion maybe didn't have full control. Ball comes out. Kenny Galladay, he, he acts like a turnstile, right, <laughs> basically. And comes yeah, by. he's like, oh, don't, don't, don't <laughs> let me stop you. Go ahead. <laughs> right, right. Oh, certainly, after you. The, <laughs> the problem is, and, and there's, there's, we'll, we'll talk through this whole thing, but there's one thing that happened there, and I think this is a, an area – that can cause trouble. Um, the side judge was coming in as if yeah. the play was over, and Galladay saw that. And from his perspective, you know, he didn't he didn't hear the whistle. I know, and 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 you you said it on your podcast. I'm certain you say it here. Say it again here. You gotta play to the whistle. We had Lions players running off the field already as, as this play is still going on, and no one heard the whistle. That ref made a mistake coming out and and you know created a situation where Galladay thought it was over but he didn't hear the whistle people are asking well is he going to get an interference or a um, unnecessary roughness call by making that tackle it's still better than a touchdown at that point you you have to chance it and if yeah. those hits start happening and that becomes something else they're going to have to do something about it and I'm going to make one more point someone said well in soccer right they wave it off hey play over play over play. They, they they yell it right but if people can't hear a whistle or aren't hearing a whistle, they're not going to hear somebody's voice yelling over. No. That whistle is no. is really not or, or don't you play on even right? There's nothing. That whistle is the one signal to stop play. Anything else is just extra noise. So I'll, I'll let you explain the whole play from this point. Yeah, there's no question, and it's it's an interesting situation. You have the added the added dynamic of this crew being the the crew that was involved in a play a couple of weeks ago with the Rams and the Saints that 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 blew a play dead prematurely. So now I think there is this focus with not just this crew, but all of the crews to really be a hundred percent sure. And, and before you kill the play and you do have the mechanic of you have that official coming in from the sideline and what, what he's trying to see, you know, did the ball break the plane of the goal line? You obviously have to move in to try to get that look. The ball comes loose. He's standing there. I think that's what Galladay, you know, reacted to, but again, it comes down to, it's such a – it was literally like this perfect set of circumstances that led to the Chiefs, you know, picking up the ball and, and going for the 100-yard score. And, uh, and then replay looked at it. You really couldn't tell if, if Johnson was down. You couldn't tell if, if the Chiefs, the first player, I think it was, it was 98, Xavier Williams, I, I think he, he's touching the ball, but he doesn't have control. He's contacted – but then the, the second Chiefs player was was just untouched, picked up the ball and went. And it's 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 a really unusual set of circumstances where you have officials coming in, nobody blows a whistle. And the thing with the whistle is the whistle doesn't necessarily mean um, you know the officials are going to signal first, and then the whistle is to tell the players to stop. So again, you always want to want those players to play to the whistle. And uh, and just even if you just grab them, you know, just grab the the Chiefs player and don't don't say you're not you're not going anywhere until they blow that whistle. But if you don't want to get that potential personal foul, but it's just a it was just a weird set of circumstances. And obviously, as I've learned in my two years as a Lions fan, you obviously and a lot of our, our listeners right now have been in it long enough, longer than that. It went against the Lions. How does that happen? How is that? <laughs> there's, a, there's a global conspiracy, I, I guarantee it. We got a call. Hey, caller, what's your name? Hey, my name is Peter Von Panda. Hey, what's happening up there, Chris? Not, not bad, man. What's happening, Dino? What's up? How you doing? Ah, loving life, living the dream, baby. Hey, uh, my question is um, <clears throat> on the last play on the game, on the Hail Mary. It looked yeah. like there was some pass interference, and I'm just kind of curious, what's the threshold for getting a PI call on a Hail Mary play? It's a, it's a great question. There's definitely contact. There's no doubt that that I, and I think it was Marvin Jones that got – there was contact. It was probably about the five-yard line. The, the Chiefs player didn't look like he was playing the football. They went to the ground. I think on a, on a Hail Mary at the end of the game, the standard, the threshold is going to – be extremely high it's going to take something like a just a blatant tackle a blatant shove in the back a blatant takedown I think when when you have two players contacting you know within contacting each other and they go to the ground I don't think that's going to be the standard um and uh, unfortunately again that was a call at the end of the game do you agree if with the call? That call 
if they make that call, the Lions get a get another play. But uh, but it's one where the threshold is going to be extremely high to get that at the end of the game. Do you, do you agree with that call? I mean, because he, he he looked like he was he was effectively pushed down from behind. I get it; it's a jump ball, but he didn't even get a chance to jump for the ball because he he was yeah. effectively taken down. You know, I, I I would hate to see as a result of this rule, officials start throwing a bunch of flags on hail marys and jump ball situations. Are those reserved players. for Aaron Rodgers? Yeah, it was. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. But it's just you know, you get the face mask. Maybe it's not a face mask. Then we throw the the, the hail mary. But it's it's a tough tough play. And and again, with replay now on pass interference, what are we doing? We're all shining a light on the, this contact, because if this rule wasn't in place, we're probably not talking about that that contact. Hey, it's a Hail Mary. It's survival of the fittest. Let's move on. But it's a, it's a the threshold is going to be very high. I can go with that. What do you think, Peter? Um, I disagree. It should be lower. It, it Let's should. make that happen. Really? Okay. Well, no, no. Uh, well, <laughs> think about, think about well, how that plays you know, out, I, right? I, I kind of agree. Yeah, I kind of agree. agree. I understand that uh, you know it's um, it's tough, but when you got a guy like Matt Stafford who can throw a clear over a mountain range, I think a fifty-yard hail mary for most people is more just like a you know a a quick throw for that dude. So you know, hey, you gotta you gotta weigh it that way. You know, it's a Matt Stafford quick throw, and uh, everyone else is a hail mary. So that's how I think it should have been uh, done. I'm gonna I'm, I, I get where your head's at there, and I'm gonna disagree a little because you still have to get those guys down there and they're getting down there at the same speed. So it's still going to be a jump ball when they get there, whether you throw it on a rope or, or you have to arc it through the, the, the open dome because of the sunny day. Um, I just, I, I, I think it's going to wind up with the same result with a big group of guys doing a jump ball. Um, and the other side of it is, and this is where, okay, I, I can, I can agree with the, the standard because if, if, if what we saw on Sunday becomes a standard, I feel really, really good about our holding on to a lead at the end of the game against Green Bay in the future because that is one of the key plays out of Aaron Rodgers' playbook, right? Draw the flag on the Hail Mary. Not just the 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 face mask, the you know, that questionable one, but a number of times we've seen him burn team after team after team drawing um penalties, uh inter- pass interference penalties on on plays mm-hmm. like that. I hear you, man, and uh I also want to uh hope Megatron's listening. Come back. Come back to the team, brother. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if he's even coming back for an autograph session at this point, buddy. <laughs> All right. Love love your work, guys. Keep it up. Thank you, Peter. All right. We'll, uh, Take care off. Of Keep on keeping on, brother. All right. We'll see you, man. Thanks. All right. All right. That's it. Like we said, Dean will take any question you've got. Bring it out. 248-782-8384. 248-782-8384. And uh, we'll work through. Um, I've got one for you that uh, came up in the Reddit, and it was I, I really like this question. It's a little bit windy, so so let me get my reading uh, my reading voice on. Right? <laughs> um, if the officials let questionable situations play out instead of whistling them dead, won't it inevitably inevitably lead to players who are standing around getting wrecked because of no whistle? How's the player supposed to know what to do now that any borderline hit is flagged as a personal foul? This is going to that Galladay piece. He tackled the player. Yeah, if yeah. he had tackled the guy that picked up the ball, uh, wouldn't even flag ninety five percent of the time for excessive roughness in that scenario. And and it's, I think it's a it's a, it's a fair question. It, it is. It is a valid question. And there's always been this balance between you you want the officials to blow the whistle at the end of every play when they're sure the play is over because you need the play the players need to know when to stop. And, and I think because then you get into a, this, hesi- this hesitancy on one player and another player doesn't stop, and now you get somebody that gets blown up and you have a safety issue. And I think it's, it's really that balance between you have to be 100% sure the play is over. And when you are, you blow the whistle and then everybody stops. And, and, and I think then the message to the players is if you don't hear the whistle, then you have to play until you hear the whistle. Now, don't do anything, and that doesn't mean I, – I truly believe had, had, had Galladay had, – had he tackled the Chiefs player, I don't think that would have been a personal foul. I, I think that would have just been, hey, they let the play go. He made the tackle. Now, if you just take a cheap shot, if you do something different, hit somebody in the head, that's different. And I think the players – I think the players understand that, and, and you learn from a very little, small – you know, small – when you're playing peewee football to, to play to the whistle 
I think the officials have to blow the whistle to give the players that opportunity. And the players have to understand, hey, if I don't hear a whistle, I'm just going to keep playing like I normally do. And you do learn that unless your name is Vontez, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, and he learned, I mean, he learned and it's, he learned the hard way, unfortunately, but this is a guy that, this is a guy that has had a lot of chances. And I know the league has done a lot with him as they do with other players who end up being, um, you know, repeat offenders mm -hmm. and they work with them and have them in. And, uh, and this is a guy that just continually um, played, you know, over that line. And, and obviously he's lost, you know, he's been suspended quite a bit and, and, uh, and it, think, it impacts him. So this is – hopefully he can get it right at some point. Do you think the league's going to let him back? I, I feel like it should I, be – I don't know. I really I, I don't. Like I don't know. I don't know at this point. This is not a second chance at this point. This no. is – you know, I don't know how many chances you get, but, um, yeah, I really don't know. I think – I mean, I, you know, you can't tie these things together, and, and, and this is obviously speculation, but, you know, AB seemed to be a relatively – you didn't see the things you saw like this this off season, right? And that that hit from Perfect. Maybe maybe it caused a, a change, right? I mean, but this guy has has very likely hurt a lot of people permanently. Uh, the way he's playing, and uh, obviously to me, it's like you know, it's it's malicious enough that he shouldn't be in the league. But that's just me. I'm not I'm not Mr. Goodell. Uh, I think there's a lot of people around the league that agree with you. Yeah. All right, so we got that uh, two four eight seven eight. Two eight three eight four. Feel free to give us a call. Here's a question that we got out of the Reddit as well. Um, this one's interesting. Is the rule book in complete disarray? <laughs> um, if coaches, refs, owners, and players are unsure what constitutes a catch, what's pass interference, when should a play be blown dead due to forward, stopped forward motion, when players are being called for late hits before the whistle, how can they be expected to play till the whistle, right? There's just a lot of inconsistencies. Inconsistencies. Uh, also, we heard in a, um, it was in the chat just now, and in here they're talking about in a loud stadium where you can't hear the whistle. Is there a way to amplify that sound and make it audible to the players? Uh, there was in this in the chat someone was saying I was right near the field level and I couldn't hear the whistle half the time because the crowd was so loud. No, that that's definitely an issue. If you ever if you ever have been on the field for a game, that's something you don't you don't always hear the whistle. You don't hear. Even a referee's announcement sometimes can be difficult to hear, and uh, and that's why you you want the officials to be demonstrative when they come in and, and and the signals that they give. So there's a visual, and there's there's the 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 audio component of the whistle so that players know um, that the play is over. You know, I would say the rule book is the rule book is not in disarray, but I I do feel like look sometimes football is a complicated game and the rules can get complicated. And I think sometimes when you have situations and you have human beings like the officials that are trying to administer these situations, it can become somewhat overwhelming at, at, at times. And I think what you were trying to do is create, make the rule book simpler for the officials. Think about, just think about the number of fouls in the player safety area in, in 30 years ago compared to today, there are so many more opportunities for fouls because you now you have defenseless players and you have use of the helmet and, and all of these things that weren't in the rule book 30 years ago. So now you have so many more opportunities for the officials to throw flags, more things to consider. So I think, I think the league just needs to look at it and continue to, to not change rules for one play mm -hmm. and, and to take a big picture approach and try to make things simpler. Less variables is going to lead to more consistency in terms of the officials performance. And I think that's, that has to be the goal moving forward. Sure, sure. All right, let me. I'm going to go back in time from the the play with um with carry on and uh, stretching towards the goal and Kenny being our favorite turnstile. We love Kenny, right? It was just it was it, that play was across the board just a mess for for yeah. a lot of people. So, um, ahead of that, you know that play. No, we're not even talking about it. But I, I think somebody who really has a personal vendetta against you know your love for the city of Detroit and the people of Detroit a guy named uh, Anthony Hitchens, <laughs> this guy, this guy alone, Anthony Hitchens. And I'm sure he's a wonderful human being. And I'm sure he does. I'm sure he has a wonderful family. He does a lot in the community, but this guy needs to stop because he is, he has single handedly made me have to drive around Detroit in the trunk of a car because, because of Anthony Hitchens. I was thinking of you um, during the game. Was, my eyes were closed. I was leaning back. Um, 
<laughs> it was it reminded me of the Jets game last year. Remember you tweeted, that's a catch, boys. <laughs> and oh, then it we wasn't. Got this one. Right, right, right. We got this one. Um I saw that and in the replay, his hand his his hand was on the face mask of the guy or the face of his helmet before the ball was there. Right. So let's let's let me do this. First Fate, you, you can face guard. Explain what face guarding is for people. Sure. And and we'll start there and we'll try to work through this. Because especially with face guarding twice, we've had Anthony in the in the picture doing this. This is this is a good one. Yeah, and it, the, the face guarding that 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 term was is used to describe a, a defensive player that's that's not playing the football, but they're playing the man and they're just basically mirroring what the receiver does and they're taught to to watch the receiver. When his hands go up, that's when that's when you look back and try to defend the pass. So so as long as there's no contact, I can face guard a receiver, be between him and the football. Um, that's fine. But now once you create contact before the ball arrives, now the official has to consider, okay, did that contact and the language in the book is significantly hinder the receiver's ability to make a play on the ball. That's where face guarding then can, can graduate to pass interference with that contact. And, and so that play, there's definitely contact. It would have been interesting if, if coach had challenged, if Patricia had challenged what the league would have done um, if they would have created that foul um, in replay. Yeah. And, and, and we'll get to that, that, that lack of challenge from Patricia there really, really frustrated me. And he's still a young coach. He's still learning, but I think he didn't because of the earlier challenge that he, that he burned, but we got a caller. Hey caller, what's your name? Hey, Chris, this is Greg down in Columbus. Hey, Greg, how you doing? Good, man. How are you? I'm great. I think you met Dean uh, at the party, right, Greg? I did. I did. Long hair, <laughs> guy's big arm, big buff dude. Yeah, what's that? up, Greg? <laughs> Dean, how you doing? Hit I'm good. I'm all good. over the place. Is, is, is your girl listening? <laughs> <laughs> no, she's not. Hey, uh, <laughs> hey Dean, I kind of I kind of touched on this question with, uh, with Chris and, uh, and Jeff the other day, but I, I wanted to kind of get your take on it. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts were on with how frequently the league is doing all these minor tweaks and changes to the rules and, you know, wholesale changes like we've seen with uh, reviewing pass interference and all that. Uh, what kind of effect do you think that has on the, the quality of officiating uh, from season to season? And can that be why we're seeing a lot of uh, inconsistency? It feels like the NFL that I watched growing up, um, and again, you know, I wasn't quite as involved with watching, but, it feels like there were a lot fewer rule changes back, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and, and the officiating was, uh, uh, I say less suspect at the time. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's absolutely part of it. And, and there are certainly, we were just talking about how many, how many rules have been added to the rule book just in the safety area. And then that's, and that that's over overall, that's a positive thing. The game is safer. I think, than when it was what it was 30, 25 years ago, 20 years ago, but more rules and, and more changes every year. Now you have an officiating staff that has to learn these rules. They have to then figure out how are we going to officiate them? How can we be consistent? You have 17 different crews, seven officials on every crew. Um, that's a challenge. And, and so if everything stays the same from year to year, then there's nothing to, to learn or relearn. But when you have, 10 changes, 12 changes. Okay, now we got to figure all this out. We go through the preseason. And the problem with the preseason now is nobody's playing. Starters aren't playing in the preseason. So, so the speed, the intensity, everything is, is, so, is like so many levels below where it is in the regular season. And now you're, you're kind of thrown to the fire week one. And, uh, and I think it's a challenge. So there's no question that m more rules changes every year is not necessarily conducive to more consistent officiating. It's definitely, it's the opposite. Do you think that there may, we, we may ever see a time where the league says something to address that we're like, they say we're going to take a year moratorium or, uh, from changing any rules just to try to allow everybody a chance to adjust? I, I think it's a great idea. It's something that's been discussed. When you look at the, the NCAA rules change process in football, they're, they're on a two-year cycle. So you can't change. The only rule you can change year to year would be something player safety related um, or something that is so just that goes to the integrity of the game, something that would, have, would be so significant. So they can't change rules every year. It's a two-year process. And I think that makes sense 
um, with the NFL that I think safety related, you'd have to be able to change it if it was significant. But other than that, I think a moratorium would make sense because that gives everybody an opportunity to, to adjust and, and more so than just kind of flying by the seat of our pants every season. Interesting. What do you think about, we, we touched on this um, gosh, about a year and a half ago, but what do you think about the idea of professional full-time referees for, instead of, instead of the kind of, we've got a part way version now, what's the argument for, and what's the argument against full-time refs? Well, I think it's a, it's a, it's a misnomer to when we say full-time, full-time refs in the NFL, because they do major league baseball umpires and NBA referees, they're full-time because they work games throughout the week. Right. right. So, right. you know, all they're working million all. games a year, can't get rid of it. But, but these, you know, umpires and, and NBA referees or NHL referees, it's not like when they're not working games, they're at a team facility and looking at film, you know, they're full time because there's more games during the week. NFL officials, you just, you don't have, you have the one game each week. And then, so by nature, you, you, when, when officiating started, they, they had to have other jobs right. and, and it makes sense for them. They are certainly reviewing film. They're doing a lot of things during the week um, away from their other professions. And the way it's evolved today is because the compensation has gotten to a point where it allows NFL officials to do this. They've kind of, a lot of them have just, gone away from their other profession and are just officiating. Um, it's, I don't think there's an easy answer. I think anytime you could spend more, more time doing what you do, like honing your craft, you're going to be better at it. But, but what does a full-time NFL official do during the week other than watch film and review tape and get ready for their game? Are they going to go work practice at a, you know, at a facility, you know, if they live in, Baltimore, are they going to go work Ravens practices? That can, can, can become a problem because if they mm-hmm. become too familiar with that team, now you create a perception. So it's, it's an interesting dilemma. I do think NFL officials spend a ton of time, you know, 20, 30, sometimes 40 hours a week um, looking, at, looking at their, you know, their games and other games and, and getting ready. But uh, What's the total just, head count on officials in the NFL? So there's the, currently there's 122. So there's 17 crews of seven uh, for 119, and then there's three what they consider swing officials that can go in in case if there's an injury, kind of bounce around a little bit, and uh, so you have a little bit of a cushion um, when when officials get injured. So you it's 122. Have, you could have the hockey league family working them on the uh, on the weight room during the week, get them some work there. That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> is there is there something to the ho- hockey league? Uh... Monarchy. <laughs> well, you know what's interesting is that when you talk about most of the officials that come from officiating families are usually the better officials, so because they've been around it. Yeah. And Ed Hockley was was an excellent official for a long time. His his son Sean is going to be an excellent official in the NFL. You have other families, the Steratores. You know, Gene Steratore does is a rules analyst for CBS. His brother Tony works in the NFL. You've got other families. Um, the, there's, there's several sets of brothers, Paganelli's, um, they're from Michigan, um, the Bergman's that, so this, these officiating families are, are usually some of the better officials just because they've been around it. You grow up around it, that you understand. Uh, so, so there's definitely something to that as to why the, uh, you know, the hockey league name will continue to live on in, in NFL history. What about these uh, th- these other rules of analysts? You were really laying into Macaulay before the show today. <laughs> you were dogging on those guys. No one, even Pierre. I mean, Pierre, he's he's right there with you, and you, you don't take any crap from him. Huh? No, we have a lot of fun with it, and and it's it, it's an interesting, you know, it just goes to show the the scrutiny on officiating today that every network has. Um, felt the need, and rightfully so, to have a rules analyst. And Warren obviously has um, felt the yep. need, and rightfully so, to have Hello? a rules analyst. Yeah, yeah. Hey, can you turn down the volume a little bit there in the background? This is this is real. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so. I got it. How you doing? What's your name? Okay. Hey, it's I'm Mike from uh, Indianapolis. How you doing, Mike? Hey, pretty good. Hey, I, I want to ask Dean um, about illegal formation. Is that a rule that has 
that is, that is really sort of outlived its usefulness? That's, you know, that's an interesting question. That's a good question. I think um, because the illegal formation, and there's several different types, but the illegal formation, that rule has been in there to give the defense an opportunity to know who's eligible and who isn't. So you, you have to have eligible players on either end of the line. You can't cover up an eligible player. So um, that would be if you have a tight end on the end of the line, you can't have the receiver up on the line as well. And what that does is it allows the defense to know that that player on the end of the line is either eligible or not eligible. So, so I think if you talk to defensive coaches, they would say that rule absolutely has to stay in place uh, because it it gives the defense an opportunity. You know, I already ripped that page out of his rule book. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I, I hate to see a big play call back because, you know, somebody was just was too far up on the line. They made a mistake. So you do allow what the officials do do, if if it's a legitimate legitimate mistake, they'll let the player adjust. You, you'll see the line of scrimmage official watch. The line of scrimmage official will tell that receiver, and you'll see receivers will look to that line of scrimmage official and say, hey, am I good? I'm, I'm, I'm a, am I up on the line? I'm a, am I off? And so officials will try to help those players because you don't want a big play called back on some some technicality. But But I would say that – I think the the rule is probably still useful at this point. But I guess what my my question is is since we all know the eligible numbers, and if the if the official says okay number seventy six is eligible, then okay that that makes sense. But you know we all know the eligible numbers, right? Yeah, no, we do, and that, and that's and it's a good point because you do have you know seventy six comes in and he's going to report as eligible. He has to tell the referee. The referee makes an announcement. But what you do worry about, and and Chris mentioned Coach Belichick, but you do have very very smart coaches, and Coach Patricia comes from that tree where if you if you take that rule out, you know what unintended consequences are there? What kind of what kind of funky things will coaches think of to try to trick the defense. And we saw that in the playoff game a couple of years ago against the Ravens when they had an eligible number player report as ineligible. And, uh, and I think, you know, I haven't heard too much conversation uh, in league circles or with the competition committee to take those rules out, but I get your point. Everybody should know, you know, who's eligible and who isn't. Okay. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, you got call, it. Mike. Appreciate it, man. Let's see, that's great. We're gonna take those any are questions. good. I like those questions because that gets into that's not that's not like the sexy pass interference. That's like, hey, we're getting into the nitty gritty. Like <laughs> that's that. a guy who's read the rule book. That's that's very Detroit, you know. <laughs> pass interference questions are L.A. That yeah, yeah. formation. That's very Detroit. I like it. <laughs> Let me ask you. Um, this is one that 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 just bothers me a little bit. Holding the the ten yard for holding, I really yeah. feel like it should be a five yard penalty, right? Especially a, a couple reasons. One, the athleticism of the defensive players against the offensive players. It's getting pretty wacky, pretty out of out of bounds. I don't say out of bounds, but the it's becoming uneven, right? And um, it's it's just the the nature of of athletes today and the and the roles that they have. Um, additionally, we you know we talk about it. It's the the, the the shorthand is, ah, there's holding on every play, right? But it only gets called when it gets called. A lot of people call some things holding when they're not, but, you know, well, it a grip on it. But there's a lot of times when, you know, these holding things happen. It feels like the way the league is now that 10 yards for a little hold when it gets called is, more often than not is is just too much. Is, yeah. is there a thought or any thinking around making it a five-yard penalty or even doing, because we saw snacks get, basically <laughs> basically headlock held uh at the end of the game when they scored there in the KC game this week um like they did with face mask right it was 5 or 15 is there an idea sure. maybe 5 or 10 for the egregious hold versus the you know the the little one yeah i i don't i don't necessarily disagree with the concept of holding being because especially when you consider the gap between the defensive the defensive line and the offensive line just yeah. in terms of athletic ability and and speed and quickness uh, the offensive lineman is definitely at a disadvantage today. And, uh, you know, holding used to be holding used to be a 15 yard penalty and, and, and it, yeah. it, it went to 10. Um, I, I don't think the league would, because you don't want to then liberalize it to the point where now you've eliminated the defense's ability to make a play and, and take sacks out of the game by just, Hey, it's only a five yard penalty. Just, 
just take them down. We don't want a whole bunch of, of holding calls like we did earlier this season. Yeah. Uh, so I think I think the league is comfortable with holding where it is the ten yard penalty. It does help to protect the quarterback a little more, though. There's there's no question that that holding you know would help protect the quarterback, but I, I do think that, <laughs> that they're comfortable <laughs> with with where it is, and and again it's it's such a a subjective call because you know there's so much blocking that happens outside the frame. I think the league's trying to clean it up. You saw the numbers were were so high the first two weeks, and everybody was screaming about the number of holding calls. Well, if you want to get rid of holding, then you gotta you gotta call it, right? That's the only way players are going to change technique and and coaches are going to adjust. Uh, so I think the league is comfortable where where the penalty is right now, mm-hmm. um, but it is something to certainly look look at going forward. Yep. Yep. All right. Um, the last one we read out of the uh, the Reddit, they did end on a, on a kind note. It's, Thanks, Dean. You have a tough job. Sorry for all the angry fans directing their anger at you. It's clearly not your fault. But who should they be angry at? <laughs> I, you know, there's probably there's probably a list of people they could be angry at yeah, ahead of me. But I'll be fine with anybody else other than me. But I, you know, it's it's officiating, right? By nature, no one. When when have you ever gone to a Lions game or I don't care what game it is, a high school game, basketball, whatever sport, and people walked away going, wow, that was just the officials were, were outstanding. It's just it doesn't happen. <laughs> you know, if, if you're not talking about the officiating, that's a win. And, and, and so by nature, this is going to be negative. This is going to be we're looking for somebody to blame. Officials are expected to be perfect where no one else out there is expected to be perfect. And, uh, and that's just part of it. So, you know, you can blame a whole list of people, but it's never going to change the fact that, that there are going to be things that happen out on the football field that, that officials are going to miss just because it happens so quickly. And, uh, and we just, and, and what I've learned, and this is, this is some, some people don't like to hear this, but that the successful teams overcome. Yeah you know, officiating mistakes. They did, they just do. And, and that's, and that's what happens. And it looked like this was one of the, I don't want to say one of the first times, but the first time in a long time that the lions had the composure to work their way through a lot of couple kind of questionable situations there. They did. And, and they had a chance to win. They, they, they kept themselves in the game where maybe, maybe some teams the you know, some lions teams or even other teams, you know, from previous years would have, would have kind of folded and, and, and the game would have gotten away, but they were right in it till the end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Peter Von Panda, he, 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 we gotta, I gotta hook you up with this guy. He's got a hilarious sense of humor. Um, he's got a good question. What about hurdling? Is that something we should ban or uh, think I, about? I, mean, I, you know, I made a note to myself during the game and, and I've, you know, this is something that the NCAA has discussed. Um, hurdling by the runner and you watch when you you don't need any other example than than Hawkinson on Sunday with what happened to him yeah. and you know it's it's illegal in high school if if the player you can hurdle a player who's already on the ground but if a player defensive player is upright you can't attempt to hurdle him that's a foul and that's what Hawkinson did and we saw what happened you put yourself at such risk and it was so scary to see him hit the ground and and you have that you know it's called that fencer's pose yeah. when he, it's, position, it's yeah. so scary and uh you know if he doesn't leave his feet that doesn't happen and obviously there's other ways to get hurt but i think this that's one the league i think should take a look at and again those are i mean how many times do we see those on highlight reels when the guy jumps over somebody but you know, is that worth it? The one, two, three times it happens a year to to risk, you know, those types of head injuries or or, or other types of injuries. I think it's something the league should look That's at. That's what officially kicked off Hockamania in Detroit was the week one hurdle that Hawkinson did and everyone was on fire. We see Logan Thomas do it in the Kansas City game. It wasn't maybe fully effective, but you can get a sense here that this is, you know, hey, I'm going to I'm going to make the ESPN highlights, the I'm team, try, yeah, right, exactly. right? I'm I'm going to build my brand, whatever. And and there's not, there's nothing wrong with building the brand or whatever, but you look at a guy who who who's young, has so much potential for this team and to put himself in a position like that, 
at the end result, you know, he was the wrong, the wrong end of the highlights this week. Right. And it's just not yeah. worth it for him. And I'm sure Matt, Patricia, I'm, Bob Quinn is probably going to come down and have a talk with Matt and say, we, we, we need, I already put an end to it. Don't worry about it. We need to stop this because I they looked imagine, like they were doing it for fun. You know, I would imagine they, that they, they would put a stop to that because, and, and it doesn't, and even if you don't get hurt, you put, you know, you're, you're airborne, you can't protect yourself, but how many times have you seen a runner jump and then fumble the football, get hit? I mean, you you could hurt the team as well, and uh, and obviously the safety part is more important. But still, that's it's just not it's a it's a high risk kind of low reward type play. Yeah. And and there's Bryce in the in the chat's got a lot of great points he's bringing up. He's like, well, what are you going to do about people? You know, people diving at runners' knees, right? And that's that's you know that's a safety issue. That that I mean that's part of tackling, but at the same time, you know, you definitely an exposed point in a lot of players, a lot of knee injuries. And then what about running sure. backs diving over the line? We don't want to talk about extending at the line right now, but but diving over the line with the ball, right? Those those are all plays that invoke that kind of thing. How do you sure. legislate Right. And then you can, it's not easy. Yeah, it's not easy. Right. And I think you start with where the high school is and in space when you have a kind of a one-on-one situation and you're just trying to jump that, which is, which is kind of what happened with Hawkinson versus not, you're not trying to take away the dive at the goal line or, mm-hmm. or jumping over a player that is not upright. You know, the player that dives at your legs, you, you have to be able to avoid that. I right. think that's, um, but I think that's, it's just a scary, scary play when you watch it. Yep. All right, let's do something that we I want to get into that, but we had this other piece come in. You, you talked about it in your podcast. Good, good calls with Dean Blandino available on um, iHeart. It's on iTunes, everywhere you, you find your and, podcast. And I'm keeping track of how many people from Detroit download the the. How are we podcast. doing? How are we so doing? I'm, I'm, I want a high number, guys. Come on, let's go. <laughs> let's pump it up. Pump that. You got. We need bigger numbers, right? Um, no, but you were talking about it on, on this week on the show, and you did a great breakdown of the Lions game. Appreciate it. Um, but one of the things you talked about was you, you dove into your DMs, <laughs> and you, and the one, I, I and I give you so much credit because we've talked about how it's just so horrible. I, you know, I get a mention by you, or we'll talk on Twitter, and I, I see the stuff that comes flowing in, man. And I, my heart just goes out to you, the, the, the stuff that that people take, because there's some pretty caustic stuff out there. But then uh, the, the the one video shot out, and they were like, "What did they? They totally mispronounced it. It was it was fun. I don't know if they were doing that or purposefully or what, but they were. It was some version of my name, <laughs> and I don't that know. Have been what, drinking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so came out and you retweeted it, but you did a great, a great little thing about uh, into your DMs, diving into your DMs, and uh, I'd love just to get kind of another representation, if you don't mind, of something that uh, the, you tweeted the one, where, oh. the guy with the CTE. It's, it's the way let's just go. Let's just go in right now. I'll pull up my phone. Let's see what we got here. I, I'm sure I can find something from. Okay. Oh yeah, here's here's this is from. Hey Dean, you ready to go? Detroit Lions podcast. Oh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't, can, I don't I don't know if you can if you if if that'll come up if you can read that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you fucking suck. That's yesterday. <laughs> That's from Danny. And it's it's what I what I appreciate about that is it's it's to the point. It's not long winded. It's like I know where I stand with Danny. Yeah, yeah. I don't. There's no. There's no like, well, does he like me? Does he not like me? Not I getting a Christmas card, right? Exactly. <laughs> and the store needs a hug, not getting a Christmas card. There yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, all right, that's cool. Well, I appreciate you taking all all that heat. Um, we got a call from uh, a question from Sweeney. You guys can call if you want as well. Two four eight seven eight two eight three eight four is the number. Two four eight seven eight two eight three eight four. Dean's here. He'll answer anything. Just ask the question. He'll do it. Just don't be a jerk. Um, can you explain why a holding flag wasn't thrown on the Mahomes scramble? Now, that, that seems silly because he runs all over the place usually. But um, the play where the hold sprung him and Mahomes looked back at the ref. Now we know what we're talking about, right? Because <laughs> he looked back and he was waiting for the flag. <laughs> it's like he looked the ref funny, off, you know, right? He is, he's, he's amazing. Like, I'm sorry, but that yeah. he is... He can do, he does things like when have you when have you seen a quarterback take his eyes away from downfield and look back? I mean, he does the no look pass. He's he, you know, there's not many guys that can do that. Look back, you know, whether I don't know whether he was looking at the ref or not, but but it certainly looked that way. <laughs> and uh, you know, I look like you said it 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 probably was holding. I mean, there's certainly that. Not every time a defensive player gets held does it get called. 
and and we have to remember that there are there are 22 players, there are only seven officials, and they're looking in areas. It's a lot of zone coverage, and and maybe the official just didn't have his or her eyes at that point, um, and and they missed it. And and sometimes you're going to get that that call. Sometimes you're not going to get it. But, uh, but you hope that the officials wouldn't miss, you know, wouldn't miss that consistently. I can tell you who's not getting it. At least the people <laughs> that are watching right now are saying. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. All right. That's, that's, that's good stuff. All right. Well, I'm going to, I'm just going to go in, into one question. I'm going to ask it because, you know, on, on Reddit and on Twitter, there is 400 million keyboard warriors, right? And I, I got a thing for it here. Sure. Dear guys. Is Dean going to talk about the party bus? Because he's mean, and I don't like him, and I'm a big tough guy, and I'm going to go into his DMs and tell him he fucking sucks, period. Um, the end. <laughs> let's let, let's talk about it, right? Because no, no one yeah. seems to have the nuts to, to ask the question for real. So I, I, I will, and we'll just have the conversation. There's a lot of talk about it. Talk about the timing of when it happened, how it happened. Kind yeah, of, I, I, I have think- a feeling you don't... You, to, if you had to do it again, you do it differently. But People, the, the story, it's just like anything else, right? It's like, it's like the, 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 the fish story. You caught, you catch a, you catch a fish that's this big. And, and five years later, it was, you know, yeah, it was, oh, yeah. it was six feet long. Right. So one of the things with, with the position I was in at the NFL as head of officials, you are, you, you are building relationships and you, and you service the clubs and you have to communicate with coaches, general managers, owners. And, and what I learned is the better the relationship, the, the more likely they were to see my perspective. If look, the bottom line is if you think somebody is a jerk, then you're going to be less likely to listen to what they have to say. And so I always try to just build good relationships with, with everyone. And this was a situation where, the Cowboys train out in L.A., um, in Oxnard, not L.A., but but just north in Oxnard. Yes. I've known Stephen Jones from his – he was on the – he is on the competition committee, so I've known Stephen Jones through those – we'd spend nine days in, in Florida, and that's not just Stephen Jones. That's that's Mike Tomlin and Mark Murphy from the Packers and, and Rich McKay from the Falcons. So you have this group of people that you become um, friendly with and, and you're – and so Stephen Jones, I had known, uh, they were at dinner out in Hollywood and, and, you know, said, Hey, you want to meet us for dinner? I said, yeah, sure. I wasn't doing anything. Met them for dinner. We're going to go get a drink up the street. I didn't know I met them there. I didn't know they had the bus. I should have thought they had the bus. So I was like, yeah, okay, we'll go get a drink up the street, get on the bus. And now we're in, we're in West Hollywood we pull up to some, some nightclub, there's paparazzi, TMZ. So we're pulling up and I'm going, Oh, this can, is probably, can you definitively not gonna say there was no hookers and blow on that bus? There was no hookers <laughs> and no blow on that thank bus. You. Okay. Thank you. It, it was a group of people having a good time. We had just come from dinner. And so, you know, I only, that's, I, I do that in the privacy of my own home. I don't <laughs> right, do right, right, right. So <laughs> how, how any sophisticated literally, gentleman would. <laughs> literally get off the bus. I've got like this sheepish grin on my face, go into the nightclub, spend about 10 minutes in the nightclub. I leave, I take an, I take an Uber home and, and that was it. That, that was it. Then the next day, obviously somebody recognized me and it became this, this huge story. And so what Lions fans, and I've had so many Lions fans talk to me about I was on the bus the night before the Lions Cowboys game, okay? okay? And because that's what the Cowboys that's what they were doing. They were in LA the night yeah. before that game. Where else so would you be? This happened during training camp. <laughs> and and so it was just one of those things and it, be, and it took on a life of its own because then I had I had the Cowboys fans saying the next week the only reason we reversed the des call was because that was my way of not Paying saying for the bus. being on the Cowboys bus wasn't going to compromise me. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. well, now just so you know, you're being indicted in the other direction. You, you're yes. a loser because that bus sounds lame. Uh, <laughs> yes. there you go. There you go. Poor decisions all around. All right, no, well, thanks and appreciate it, and uh, I love the clarity. And it's exactly right, right? I, no one's put the two and two together of being in LA the night before 
a, a game in Dallas in the playoffs, right? It doesn't seem yeah. to work. But thank you for that. Thanks for answering that. And like we said, D to answer anything. I see keyboard warriors. You can go to sleep on that one. Got a good question here. Do the officials get awed by players like Mahomes, right? And I, I know you, you've been in this and watched the game a lot. And, and you, I, I mean, obviously are odd by what he can do. I am as well. He seems just to be amazing on the field. But does it happen to a point where they get caught being a spectator on a given play? Or maybe they miss a penalty that they should have been on? I mean, at some level, they have to be fans of the game. And, and, and I can, yeah. like, I don't, we played against Mahomes, right? And I can actively say that that guy's a great player and he is super, super fun to watch. Uh, the KC game, the blowout game last year. What was the one with the um, – who did they play? Well, the most exciting game of the season was like week four or five. Um, they played the Rams. That was like yeah, the 50, yeah, 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 yeah. 49 game, whatever it was. What, loved it. Absolutely loved yeah. it, right? And uh, what do you think? Can can I know they work hard not to, and I know – I mean, maybe we can talk a little bit about how the officials are graded and looked at and measured sure. over time. But um, – you think that happens? You think ever they're, they're like, holy cow, I, look at this guy. You know, I, I don't think, I think when the officials get to that level, and they're, they are evaluated on every play, they're evaluated, scrutinized like no other profession that I've been a part of. And, and, and so, but they're human beings, right? So if they see something so amazing like the rest of us, there's going to be a, a some kind of a reaction. You would hope it would be an internal reaction. We don't want a bunch of officials out there, you know, <laughs> high-fiving. But I think they recognize special ability. They recognize the special plays, but they have a job to do. It's, it's, it's so – when you talk to these officials, I mean, they are so focused on their responsibilities and their area um, of focus. And, and the thing with – even with – the quarterback, whether it's Mahomes, Stafford, or whoever, you know, the referee is responsible, but the referee has to be looking at the blocking around him that, that, you know, then, cause if I'm watching, am I watching, um, you know, that block versus the quarterback or the runner, then, then once he releases it, now I have to watch the defensive player. Does he hit the quarterback? So there's so many things they have to, they have to process and go through that it would be if if they are just you know awed by a player or the game they're not going to last very long. Sure. It's gonna it's gonna show itself very quickly in their evaluations that they're just not they're just not cut out to do. It. And let's really quick talk a little bit about those evaluations. I don't want to go super super deep, but how do you how do you yeah. look at these guys every and gals every week and uh, at their performance and evaluate? Them? Yeah, they're they're so you have you have former officials that work as supervisors that evaluate each game. They look at every play. They look at the calls that are made, and they and they grade them. You know whether it's a correct call, an incorrect call. They they look at calls that should have been made, and then and then there's an evaluation report that goes to that crew. Each official has a has a, an accuracy score, and uh, and that is cumulative throughout the season. So it's something like I always tell people, imagine in your everyday life and your job that you're doing something at your desk and every decision you make is, is critiqued at the end of the day. Like it, it, it just doesn't happen. And these officials are, are, unless you're, you know, me on Twitter, I get critiqued you know, pretty, pretty consistently. Oh, but I was just writing you a DM. <laughs> it, exactly. But it's, they are heavily scrutinized and, and when they don't perform and they don't grade out, then they, you know, they don't continue in the National Football League. They don't have very long careers. I'm going to make some enemies with this one. But back when I was in Southern California, this part won't make enemies. We started a, a charter school, whatever. And uh, we were the first school that anybody we'd ever heard of that gave our teachers bonuses, right? And, and it was performance-based. They were great. I mean, there was tears when we showed up because they were unexpected. It was on top of everything that we'd agreed to in the contracts. And it was yeah. it was great. It was, and it's a great school. And it's something I'm really, really proud of that we did. But one of the things that I that I had kicked around a little bit as we were doing this, and we never it ne never came to fruition because it's just not part of the culture of, of, of teaching in schools, but that score of – the teacher at the end of the year, the evaluation, right? They, they do standardized tests, which isn't the be all end all, but that's one piece. You could put together a cumulative score of these teachers and post them. So you know what you're getting. And then, then you have problems as an administrator. Everybody wants to be in this teacher school class, but not the other ones. Right. And then it's like, Oh God, that kind of transparency really hurts. But what about on the officials? Right. I mean, as you're looking through this and you're, and you're, and you're grading these folks out and, and you're saying, what's the cutoff for someone who's, Who's on the on the board? Like you know, Walt, 
<laughs> you can say what you can say good, bad, whatever you want. I'm not I'm not gonna cast aspersions like beyond. We'll just use him as a as a uh, a foil right now, I guess. Um, but to kind of be more transparent about the grading on the officials and yeah. he, he, let folks know and see where these folks are, and when they when they grade out, they grade out, and somebody else comes in. It seems like it gives you a different kind of sense of. And, and and again, it's the same thing. Well, who wants the bad official, quote unquote, on their game, right? And, oh, I lost this game because we had the bad officials. Well, I kind of feel like, and, and I'm not, I don't want to say the guys are bad officials, but on the, the Saints game last year, the Saints-Rams game, you people are saying we lost this game because of bad officials anyway, right? If all of a sudden something like that happens and you have really, really good officials that are doing it, it's like, this is obviously a, a singularity. This is a one-time thing, right? Um, any thought about that kind of you know, visibility for fans and, and teams. And yeah, I think it, it's definitely something that has been discussed. I think the transparency is you have to be careful with being too transparent. And I think the NBA went through that. And I think it's still going through that where they have that two minute report. Right. And, and so they'll list all of the, and, and it's, it's made to, it's done so they can show how good the officials are doing, but all the media focuses on is, Oh my God. In the, in the Spurs nuggets game, they made four mistakes in the last two minutes, and that cost the Spurs the game. And I think that that undermines the credibility of the officiating program, of those officials. And I think so. You there's there's there is a thing is too much transparency. It changes the conversation, right? Because you you can say they're saying that the the officials cost the Saints the game in the in the last you know bit of the of the uh, Rams game. Sure. Um, now you, you have data with it and then you can say, okay, now we have data uh, and call. Oh, I lost the caller. <laughs> we'll get you here. You can call back caller. Um, what happens about like mid season? If is, is there ever a case where someone's grading is bad enough where they're gone mid season? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's been situations. Names, right? we don't uh, no, that. but the league, the league two years ago, I think let it, let an official go mid year. That's unusual. Mm -hmm. Typically when that happens, you have an official that's struggling. You try to, you try to help them, give them some, you know, remedial help. And if, if you, you might sit them down for a couple of weeks that they're not going to work and they're going to try to get back up to speed because it's the thing that I always, and I talked to when I was at the league office, I talked to my, my kind of counterparts at major league baseball or basketball, they have volume, right? 162 baseball games. So, so that is an overwhelming number of games, right. but not every game counts as much as an NFL game. So, so you can tell a, a baseball manager, yeah, we blew that call, but you know, it's, it's a game in August. You got a hundred more to go. Whereas an NFL, you can't tell a coach. I mean, that call in that game could be the difference in their season, whether they make the playoffs and whether that staff gets, you know, gets brought back the following year. So, so much is, is, riding on these games so you want to have the, the best officials possible and, and the, ideally you know the 122 officials in the nfl are the best officials in the country and uh yeah. and, and hope that they're all they're all up to speed and up to par but as you know in any industry there's going to be different levels of confidence yeah but you, like so you think about you know the auto industry um, you have the major automakers right there. You get, you're taking the best of the best and putting them to the top, right? But there's, there's, there's a couple different industries. There's a lot of people doing the same jobs and they move between, there's just, just a lot of talent. Of course you get that kind of thing, but there, this is a real sharp pyramid to the top to get to the oh, official in the NFL, right? And they truly are the best of the best. And you think about the scrutiny that they go under um, and, and, and we get, I don't want to say part of the fun, but it is kind of part of the fun um, of of professional sports, right? There's there's the officiating, there's the chance of Marty Morning White taking the win, uh, but, but I mean all the, the that's the, that's all part of it's all part of kind of the it's it's part of what makes it enjoyable or not enjoyable but fun to watch and just what can happen next. Offici look officiating controversies are not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, you don't want to, you don't want the Rams saints play, but you know, people that's engagement, right? That's people interested in what's happening. Um, so look, I, you I, file it down I, to perfection. It's just a computer program, right? That's it. That's all it is. And then there's nothing and, to it. Yeah. And that's not, and that's just not, it's just not possible. Yep. Yep. 
All right. Well, that's it. I, we're gonna we're gonna close the tap now. Dean's been around for an hour. He's done. He's taken all your questions. I asked him the hard ones. The keyboard warriors. So <laughs> we'll keep going. Stay out of his DMs unless it's it's saying something nice. Be be, be kind to this poor guy. He's he's just working for Fox. Something now. funny. I'll 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 get it on my podcast. If oh, you my. if you can be clever and funny, a hundred percent. I'll I'll retweet it. There you go. I'm still trying to get on, guys. Uh, <laughs> good calls with Dean Blandino. Check it out. iTunes, Google Play, all the great places to get your uh, your podcast. It's 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 a great podcast. I love. For me, it's like a good driving podcast or a, a good like relaxation podcast when I'm just kind of want to not be bothered by anything and just kind of let let it kind of run in and absorb my brain and kind of take a deep breath. It's a really really good one. It's it's kind of. Um, very cognitive, very thoughtful. So I really appreciate what you're doing. Good, good show over there, Dean. Thank you for joining us again, man. Appreciate it. You guys, uh, thanks for all your calls. Thanks for all your questions. And uh, I'm going to close the show out. Remember, we need your involvement. Use the comments in the sub to give us your feedback. We love your feedback. Also, don't forget about us on Patreon, patreon.com slash Detroit Lions podcast. And uh, help us get these great guests like Dean. There, that was my NPR. Uh, make sure you follow us on Twitter at DET Lions Podcast. It's the only place to see Dean in those black socks and referee whistle. <laughs> and uh, give us a call, 929 Lions, 929-335-4667, and uh, leave a message. We'll get you on the air. Also, go to DetroitLionsPodcast.com. Subscribe to the podcast so we can show up in your little player box automatically. Thank you for tuning in. We're going to see you next time on the Detroit Lions Podcast. Remember... No pants, no toasters, no hot tubs, no problems, baby, because we're your Detroit Lions and Reddit connection. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Have a great, great day. And um, for everyone who didn't watch the YouTube, it will be available. Or you want to hear it again, it'll be available on the, uh, the normal podcast stuff.